Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third edition of the Ice the Kicker podcast. My name is Glenn Denier. So alongside my co-host, Matt Farrar, week two in the NFL is done. And Matt, I don't know about you, but this was an absolute disaster of a week, in my opinion, in the NFL. Just so many guys going down. Obviously, Saquon done for the year, torn ACL. Christian McCaffrey is out four to six, six to eight weeks the entire 49ers seem to be out. Jimmy G got hurt. Nick Bosa, mm. he's out for the year. Um, it's, it's, it's insane what's going on in the NFL. Um, is it because that there was no preseason, no, no preseason, no training camp, that they're just not in shape and now these injuries are happening? Who knows? But it was definitely rough on the injury front in the NFL this week. We'll get to the actual box scores of the games later, but we'll start with the McCaffrey and Barkley injuries you know, not only are the Giants and Panthers seasons over now, but a lot of fantasy teams, they're done too, because I think McCaffrey was averaged the first overall pick in many drafts and Barkley was third. So, you know, there's two of the two top one running backs and two top fantasy guys gone. It, it's rough. Yeah. yeah. It's again, seeing those and just kind of seeing everything. The first thing that came to mind was, all right, is it because of the lack of preseason and everything like that? To me, I, I want to say yes to some extent, but not really. It, to me, it just seems that football is just a brutally brutal sport. Mm-hmm. It's, all, it's just a terrible sport on the body. You're constantly getting hit. Guys are bigger, faster, stronger. I mean, you have running backs and wide receivers who can run 20-plus miles an hour, and then you mix that uh, with the guy coming at you probably 15 to 20 miles an hour who weighs 250 pounds. Like, just the amount of wear and tear on the body is just, is just crazy. And it's really – Kind of not really surprised to me that this many guys are getting hurt. And I remember uh, Adam Schefter said it was like seven torn ACLs just just this yeah. week alone, which is crazy. I mean, it's it's rough, and you see it more so with football than you do the other sports. Maybe basketball is a little bit of a distant second, but the but the amount of like tension and the amount of pressure you put on your knees as a running back, especially when you're just juking and cutting and making these sudden starts and stops, it really puts a lot of you know. Uh, pressure on that knee and it's amazing that we don't see it more often and when you invest big big money well technically Barkley and McCaffrey aren't making money yet but eventually they're gonna have to make money McCaffrey he, he's what he's, he's at least he because he just got paid he was what like 14 oh, he 15 did get paid? yeah he just got paid this past this past year and when, and so McCaffrey is getting paid Barkley will one day get paid if he you mm-hmm. know bounces back from this it goes back to the first episode of this podcast when we talk about you know, paying a running back, not only is it rough to do that because their careers are so short if they stay healthy, but these guys are fragile and they can, they can go at any time as we saw last week. Yeah. I, again, it's, I hate, I hate this be like, I told you so, cause I'm not going to say that, but it's, just, it just kind of proves my point a little bit that like, especially at, at the running back position specifically, you can look, look beyond what I said about how you can just find that production and those stats elsewhere and multiple guys but I talked about just diversifying and that's just diversifying risk. Same thing you would in the stock market. You would with your salary cap and especially at the running back position when you're the guy that's getting hit the most probably. And you're getting drilled by these 300 pound linemen, or you're getting drilled by a safety coming up to the line who has a 20 yard head start. It's just, it's bound to happen to one of them. And I don't, obviously I don't have the stats on me right now, but I'd probably assume that running backs get hurt most often than any other player. And again, you look at an injury like an ACL, now it's like, oh, well, is he, is he now injury prone? Or the way I look at it is that everybody's durable until you're not. Again, everyone, if you stay healthy, you're pretty much just got lucky in, in my eyes for the most part. And the really tough thing for the Giants, it puts them in almost like an impossible position with Saquon Barkley because not only does he miss the rest of this season, but – For the rest of this season now, the entire focus on opposing defenses will be Daniel Jones because they don't have, you know, they don't need to worry about Barkley because no offense to Deion Lewis, like he's not really that much of a threat in the backfield. I mean, they brought in Devontae Freeman for a workout today. We'll see if he actually signs with the Giants. Of course, they have Wayne Gallman, who they can take off of the, um, I believe he's on the practice guard. He's in, he was been inactive the last couple weeks, but I'm sure he'll Mm -hmm. be slide it in to take uh, Barkley's spot. But those guys, you know, put them all together. They're still not safe on Barkley. And not only do we miss a year of, you know, production and just like entertainment from Saquon because he's such a singular generational back, but mm-hmm. Jones's development in year two hurts because 
he doesn't have that like safety net of having a running back out of the backfield to take the pressure off him and take the workload off of him. Now he really needs to grow up in a, in a hurry because he's all alone out there. No offense to guys like a Golden Tate or a Darius Slayton or an Evan Ingram who was horrible in the first half of the Bears mm-hmm. game yesterday. And he was horrible against the Steelers too. But yeah, the, the, a lot of pressure now on Daniel Jones to perform. And maybe unfairly because he's still so, so young. Yeah, I mean, you saw that Daniel Jones threw the ball like more than 45 times in that game against the Bears, and you're going to start seeing that. He'll probably be throwing the ball 50 times, and that's where you kind of got to look at from a coaching standpoint is that, all right, you don't have Saquon, but you can't let DJ throw it 50 times. And that's not a knock on him, but it's just are you really going to get the most efficient passing game, the most efficient Daniel Jones if you run it – I mean, if you pass it uh, 50 times, which is probably something – He's not really used to it, and I don't think it'll suit him just yet, especially because you said he's still kind of coming into his own right now. And then it was a good point you wrote about the safety net with you need to establish a run game. I mean, you look at all these great teams. I mean, Brady with the Pats, when, when he did, it was just you establish the run, then you work the play action, and then you can do whatever you want. But without that established run, and obviously now you don't really have an established running back, it'll be interesting to see what they do here. However, though, I think from, from a Giants fan perspective, you're going to see basically what I was kind of saying, how, hey, you could possibly get the same stats. Again, no one's going to replace Saquon Barkley as one person. Like, not one person is going to replace Saquon straight up. But maybe you see, hey, you bring in Devontae Freeman, and you have Deion Lewis, who's more of a pass-catching back. Maybe they do turn some heads and kind of make the Giants realize, all right, well, obviously you love Saquon, but maybe you don't love him enough to invest $20 million, especially coming after yeah. an ACL injury. So it's going to be interesting to see. And I think Giants fans need to keep uh, an open, positive outlook on, all right, who's going to step up, not just in the whole team, but specifically in the running back room. And then see, hey, maybe what I was saying and we kind of talked about and agree with makes some sense. And if not, then it is what it is. And organization. Nationally for the Giants, it also puts them in a tight spot because as a first round rookie, they all sign four year contracts with a team option for the fifth year. And now Barkley is going to be hurt for the entire third year, come back in that fourth year. And then after that, the Giants need to make a decision whether they let him test free agency, whether they make him a mega extension, make him the highest paid back, you know, 12 months after, you know, coming back from a knee, major knee surgery, or to pick up that option for the fifth year, which a lot of first round stars don't like doing because then they're essentially playing on a one year contract. And if something happens like this again, then they don't make that money. And they can potentially piss off um, Saquon Barkley and his representatives and make a whole kind of like a Darrell Revis Jets situation from 10 years ago so organizationally the Giants are in an impossible spot because you don't see Barkley for the rest of this year and then you know if he doesn't like come back to his like 100% self in 2021 like that's a very tough decision to make to not only your organization but to your fan base who loves Saquon Barkley and they want him around forever to kind of make the decision like hey He's, you know, you hate to say it, but damaged goods if he doesn't come back like an Adrian Peterson did. Because this is a very, very major injury for a running back that relies on cutting and using and changing motion rapidly all the time. So it's going to be it's going to be a tough decision for the Giants from an organizational standpoint for to what to do with Barkley in years five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, again, just basically agreeing with you there. It's going to be just, like you said, extremely interesting to see what they do because, again, your your knees as a running back and basically just an offensive player in football are just – they're needed for everything. Like everything you stop on a dime, that's all right to the knee. You're cutting, and that's what he does so well is that cutting, his jumping, his quick burst, his spin moves. That's all – everything right there is, is, is going to be in the knees. And then, again, like you said, you, you hope that he comes back 120% and you see the old Saquon – but now you kind of have to prepare yourself for, all right, what if he doesn't? And then kind of get on that contingency plan sooner than they probably would have uh, liked to do. So obviously Saquon out for the year, as we said, you know, at nauseum in the first, you know, 10 minutes of this podcast, it's really horrible what, what's happened to him. But moving on to what actually happened on the field Sunday in Chicago between the Bears and the Giants, the Giants first half looked terrible. Like they, all those good vibes from the Pittsburgh was completely gone. They can't, uh, it, the defense couldn't get off the field on third down. Daniel Jones, the, he didn't have Barkley, obviously didn't really look that great through a pretty bad interception, lost a fumble. Like that, that's still a problem with Daniel Jones that he really needs to correct and he needs to correct it soon. 
But that second half, they fought, and they got it to 17-13, missed extra point. Um, not missed extra point. Missed field goal by Chicago late in the fourth quarter, gave Daniel Jones a two-minute opportunity to actually win the game with a touchdown, fell short. But, you know, it's kind of the same kind of story we have from week one with New York. They lost, yes, but you can see that, you know, their defense is much improved. They sacked Trubisky, I, I believe, four or five times. I don't have it in front of me at the moment. But they got to Trubisky. They had, a, they had an interception or two. They had two interceptions. They're, they're a very young team, but you can mm. tell through the first two weeks they really play hard for Joe Judge. Yeah, I, 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 and right off the first quarter of this, the Giants-Steelers game, I looked at, at this defense and I was like, oh, like this, this looks like a, like a pretty good defense. Like they're stopping the run. They're, they're getting after the quarterback. Like that's stuff you, you want to see. That's exciting. That's what can, can win you games. Again, obviously, yeah, you, you lost 17-13, but another, again, I, I don't want to say moral victory yet because it still was a little – sloppy and kind of in some of Daniel Jones's play, but they're, they're trending in the right direction. Like, I don't think any Giants fan right now, again, even without Saquon, is, is looking at the schedule and like, ah, we're going 0-16. Especially with how this division, yeah. it, re- it really isn't the strongest. You see with the Eagles and then you see, like, the Cowboys still 1-1 one one with the miraculous win that we'll get to later. And same thing with the Skins. Like, no one's really talent-wise, head over heels, above, I would say, the Giants. It's really like, if they yeah. just you stream some some wins together, some divisional wins. You get hot at the right time. Daniel Jones uh, kind of cleans up his turnovers a little bit. Like, why couldn't they at least make a run late in the season to try to win the division? Yeah, and the division's terrible. I mean, the Eagles look like they're a complete mess. Um, the mm-hmm. Cowboys lucked out because the Falcons, you know, can't, you know, close. <laughs> um, who knows about the Redskins and, you know, I, mean, I I went over everybody like it, it's I I get frustrated even though I fall into this trap. I really should be doing that because they did have opportunities to win these games, and to the organization as a fan to say, hey, we lost, but this happened well, so that's great. Because this is an organization that's very proud and has a very prestigious history. So it should be kind of like, you know, how the Steelers are or the Lakers or the Yankees, where it doesn't matter about moral victories. You got to win the game. And I know they're young, but, you know, there were, there were big mistakes that these, this team still made. I mean, we're happy with the way Jones has played um, thus far this season in year two. But, you know, in the fourth quarter, they couldn't get off the field in time to only give Daniel Jones two minutes. They could have given him five minutes, but, you know, there was a first and 25, and then the Bears rip off on first down a run of 23 yards. They had a stop on fourth down, but the pass was deflected in and into the hands of a lineman and just yeah. made me want to <laughs> blow my brains out. It was just insane. So it's, I feel like it's good to have these kind of moral victories, but at some point, especially in a division that's so bad and still very winnable for anyone really, and eventually the more wins have to stop and you actually have to get real wins in the standings. Oh uh, yeah. I was going to say, again, we've both played sports very competitively. We, we've been on a lot of teams and most recently we've been on teams together. And it's like, how many times again, what, what, after a loss and our coach is talking to us and he's like, all right, well we lost, but we played great. Like that effect doesn't really last too long. Like you're saying, like, yeah, you yeah. need the W honestly, I'll take the sloppy W over the hard fault loss. And I think everyone else would any day of the week. So again, early on in the season, all right, we can kind of make some excuses, even if they're a little bit valid saying, all right, we're playing good. We're getting better. We're still a young team. We're still new system, new coach, all that good stuff. But at what point are we going to make, all right, we need to win. And I don't care how you do it, how, how good or bad it looks, but we need to get a W on the board just for our own sake. And because what, what happens with that is especially with younger guys. And it's the same thing when I, when I coach, uh, the high school team, like all the kids, they have to understand that the process that they're working at right now and the goal that they're working at it is, it makes sense. And so that trust in the coach, that trust in the process, that trust in that all the hard work you're doing is for the right reasons. So you get that one win, it solidifies everything. And now we're all bought in, but until you kind of show some promise and get that actual W people are going to be like, Oh, is he the right guy? Is what he's doing the right, is this the right system? So they need to win on the board more than anybody right now, I'd say. 
Yeah, and you go across the street to the Jets, same thing, 0-2, and and you're hearing all the rumblings. Is Gase going to get fired? Is Sam Darnold Mm -hmm. the guy? If they go 0-16, do they keep Darnold and trade the pick, or do they get Trevor Lawrence out of Clemson? Like, eventually, you got to win actual games to shut up all the critics. Now, the Giants' Mm -hmm. critics have been very forgiving up until this point. New coach, new system, new philosophy. Um, First year quarterback in terms of being the guy first full year as the starting quarterback but eventually those are going to subside because Matt this is a franchise that again very prestigious has a very illustrious history four Super Bowls all these great players all all the whole shebang they've started seasons 0-2 for seven of the last eight years That, that that's not acceptable at some point yeah and especially because I mean how many of those games I don't I don't know off the top of my head have been against the Cowboys opening day. I feel like every year it's the Cow- yeah, Cowboys, every year they play so, Cowboys opening day. So, so basically it's like, all right, you're 0-2 and you're already now 0-1 in the division. And the old adage they say is, all right, every division game basically counts as two because if you lose, they're going up one and you're going down one. So there's just that extra separation between the two. But luckily for the Giants, they haven't lost a division game yet. But it's still – it's two games. And kind of like, like we talked about last week a little bit how – the way the schedule is kind of set up is that everyone is basically slated to go eight and eight, but it's those, those four to five games where, Hey, you might have a chance to win. And are you, can you steal that game or the game that, Hey, you're slated to lose. Can you steal that game? And I think this was definitely, definitely a game that they could have stolen. And then again, when you look at the end of the season, you're like, ah, well, we went six and 10. All right. Well, maybe you steal that game. Now you're, seven and nine who knows what how bad the yeah. nfc east is if that gets them remotely in i don't know but these are the games that we need to look back on and be like shit like they could have actually got this win and it could have helped them out in the long run yeah i mean if the wild card the seventh wild card ends up being eight and eight and the giants finish six and ten you could look at oh if uh they finish the game against the bears they're seven and nine and then oh in week one if they capped off that 19 play drive they're eight and eight and they're in the playoffs i mean you're, you're exactly right about especially in the NFC where you know, it's not there's not a lot of great teams in the NFC especially mm-hmm. in the NFC East definitely missed opportunities for for the Giants and speaking of missed opportunities your Dolphins missed <laughs> an opportunity <laughs> I'm sorry I gotta I gotta we gotta segue Ugh. into the Dolphins 31 to 28 we talked about it last week whether if um as I'm losing my you know tab here if we were talked about it last week if you know if Fitzpatrick doesn't play well, it's time for two. But Fitzpatrick did all right. He just got yeah. – the, the defense just got destroyed by your favorite, Josh Allen. So, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the rundown of the game first, and then I'll give you a little, little two-minute drill on the Dolphins themselves. So, the game – again, I'm obviously going to go into every game, especially that game, division game. All right, I didn't have them slated to win when, when I did my little uh, preseason kind of review. But, again, another game where they could have won. And, again mm-hmm. – Tip of the cap to Josh, to Josh Allen and the Bills again. I'm just 24 I'm for 35, over 400 <laughs> yards passing, uh, QBR of 93.7, four touchdowns, zero interceptions. Now, if we go back into the tape in week one, you're like, I don't think Allen's the guy. <laughs> so, again, I've been shitting on Cam Newton, shitting on Josh Allen, shitting on Justin Herbert. I don't think you're oh, qualified to be on a football talk show. I, get, I know. I might be getting fired soon. But Josh Allen, it just, again, so if you watch the whole game, he still mm-hmm. made like four or five bad throws, just completely yeah. miss. However, when you're playing a, a bad Dolphins defense, you can kind of uh, forget about those. However, though, to, to give him credit, he, the, late in the game, he was just dropping dimes. And that was kind of my whole knock on Herbert going into the whole draft process was that he only has a fastball. And that was Josh Allen, too. All right, he could throw the ball really hard and really far. That's nice. But where's his touch? And then all of a sudden, he's just dropping – feathery dimes all over the place and i was just like you got to be kidding me it, it was just he I have it up here destroyed. i have a highlight i see a, a, a that must have broke your heart yeah uh, again the dolphins have always broken my heart but but now that, that i actually put some expectations on them again as i as we all should as dolphin fans they actually let me down again you had you had a little bit of a lead or you had alien by what th- three points there, and then first place from scrimmage is, is a bomb to St- Stephon Diggs for like thirty yards, and you're like, 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 like that's like the number one right, no big chunk plays, and then first play, boom, it, it was just 
a very, very weird game. And But to, to segue, because we were kind of talking about Fitz and how he needs to do better, he did do better. So, yeah. again, good job with him. Good job with the offense. They actually put up some points. Again, they, they missed in a couple – key situations here and there that's football i understand that but they were aggressive they went for it on fourth down which was awesome to see when they're on their one wide receiver preston williams dropped the ball shit happens again he, he's going to be a guy you're going to have to rely on for the rest of the season so i can't write him off yet you still hear some fans again when i see on twitter oh we got to put two in Tua it plays quarterback mm-hmm. Tua it cannot rush the passer or he cannot cover stefan diggs so what is putting two in there do does it, it does nothing for right now and, and, and thank God the offensive line looks pretty good that if he does go in, I'm not really worried that he's going to be getting demolished out there. But here's my, my – I'll try to keep this right now to under a minute or two, but just to, to the Dolphins specifically. You invested $240 million. More than 75 to 80% of that is in your defense. And you have Brian Flores, who is a defensive-minded guy, uh, Belichick disciple, all that good stuff, and you let up. 524 yards and 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 again to, to josh allen who, who i still don't think is that great yet he did really good but he was just sitting there all day and you look at the patriots game they got ran all over and you would think all right the bills are probably going to take note of that and they're gonna be all right we're gonna run too no they said screw that we're gonna pass all over you they're gonna pass all over xavier howard is getting uh top seven cornerback money they're gonna pass all, all over our our rookie uh first round draft pick, uh, no Igbenogany. And there was just absolutely no adjustments made defensively. We were getting burned on man to man. And that's the scheme we run. I get whatever. And then you lose Byron Jones. So, all right, he's your number one cornerback. You lose that guy. And we stick with man to man. All our other options right there, we're getting absolutely toasted. So why not make an adjustment? Hey, give our guys, especially your rookie cornerback, some relief, not have them cover Stefan Diggs for some reason for the whole entire game. Once Byron Jones went down, that's beyond me. And, hey, maybe go to some zone. Maybe do something to try to pre- pressure Josh Allen. It was absolutely disgusting, the lack of pressure. They had, like, one sack, and it was just – it was a covered sack. And then One we sack had for four yards, it says. Yeah, it, it, it was absolutely just appalling. And that's kind of the stuff that when we look at quarterbacks and we look at players, we want to see uh, progression. We want to see guys get better. So I feel like the Dolphins went into halftime and – offensively, they made a ton of adjustments and it was awesome. But then defensively, they just said, all right, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. And, and what they did was let up 297 yards in the first half. Mm-hmm. So, I, again, it's, it's week three in a season that I still don't expect the Dolphins to – not winning the Super Bowl, but the Jacksonville Jaguars game on Thursday night is an absolute must win. Yeah. Just like we said before, you have to have to get a win to show these guys – hey, what we're doing is the right thing. The guys in place, Flores, Chan Gailey, uh, Josh Boyer, the, the D.C., these guys know what they're talking about. So we need to get a win. I went a little over two minutes. But no, it's totally I fine. My best. And we're, we're going to keep going because this is great. I, you, as you said, you spent a lot of money on defense. And to only get one sack, and, you know, Allen has all day in the pocket to throw in you know in the rain and he's putting up these numbers of four, over 400 yards throwing i mean you say I'm, i understand saying oh it's only week three blah 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 but these aren't rookie defenders these are highly paid I, professional I, yeah defensive players you gotta you gotta do better against josh allen no res- disrespect to him we actually disagree i actually like josh allen but i don't like him enough to throw for 417 yards against the dolphins That's a, i mean uh, it, it was just like it took him wait, this is his third year and he threw his first 300-yard game passing week one. Now week two, he, 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 he gets even better. Now, all right, there's his first 400-yard. It, it was just like every time he threw the ball deep and it was out of the camera's view and they, they followed it, it was deep ball. Just, just, just perfect yeah. dime right there. Or and somehow, Dix was five, seven yards behind the receiver. Like he was just it, yeah, blowing it, by it, them. It, it, it was just like – it was so – just so confusing because you're just like – like you said, all these defensive guys, Kyle Van Noy, he, he's a veteran who's been in his system. You have Shaq Lawson, he's a veteran. Manuel Agba, he, he's a veteran. You got Christian Wilkins, Devon Gotcha on the line. They're all uh, returning guys. Like, you really only have – you had one rookie play defense. And, he, again, he got cooked by Diggs. But then why is he covering Stephon Diggs when you're paying Xavier Howard top dollar? Say, so, hey, go, go shadow the number one guy once you, Byron Jones gets hurt. So it just – very confusing there. And again, I still, 
I'm not hitting the panic button with floors by any means, mm-hmm. but just we need we need to win. We and you need to win, need to win. Matt, against Gardner Minshew, the Who man, is... the myth, the legend. Gardner Minshew almost <sighs> led his Jaguars to a two and hour start, but a uh, last second field ball guy by Goskowski gave the Titans a 33 to 30 win. Minshew went 30 for 45, 339 yards, and three touchdown passes. So it doesn't get much easier for your defense on a short week, which is very, which is huge. Well, luckily, yeah, the, the game's only in Florida, so I, I would assume that they, they might travel up just Thursday opposed to Wednesday night, so you're not really missing a day because they need all the practice that they can get right now. Again, like you said, and I, I said this I, at the end of the last uh, episode, Gardner Minshew balling out. Just absolutely easy. Hey, tank for Trevor Lawrence. He's Hell tremendous. No, dude, this, this is my job. He's it's so it's one of those – it's just like he's just – like when you talk about it factor, like he has it. And, and he has the skills to back it up. Like, he's just an absolute leader, and he's just so exciting to watch. And, uh, yeah, the Dolphins need to figure out some way. Again, you don't have to deal with the mobile quarterback anymore for, for this week. They don't really have too, too many, uh, ex- like, crazy weapons like, to the level of Stephon Diggs. Their they're running back as a name isn't anything crazy. They, they're still putting up good numbers. So there's no reason that you, you shouldn't go into this game or come out of this game saying, and have at least three sacks and maybe a couple turnovers from a defensive yeah. standpoint. I think it's a winnable game for Miami. I really do. Um, I like Gardner Minshew, but, you know, do I think the Jacksonville Jaguars will, like, go 2-1 and one to start this season? I really don't. I like them, but this is it's not an impossible game for Miami to bounce back. Yeah, again, this is a game that I had going into the season. The Dolphins, this was a guaranteed win. Does it look like a guaranteed win anymore? No. So, no. They're going to need to figure out. They're going to need to figure out fast. But this is a good opportunity for all us Dolphin fans. All right, how is Brian Flores going to going to adjust right now? How is he going to react to a little adversity? And that's what I'm excited to see. Again, not hitting the panic button by any means. It's still not two a time yet. I know everybody wants it, but we'll have to sit tight. And I'm I'm very excited, but also very nervous for Thursday night. So we got the Dolphins at 0 2, unfortunately, for Matt. We have the Bills at 2 and 0 leading the division, staying in the AFC East. We're not going to talk about the Jets because they're a complete waste of time and don't deserve our, you know, our thoughts and prayers on the show. We're going to talk about the New England Patriots and the Seattle Seahawks in the late game. Really, really good game. Really, really entertaining. I was going back and forth between the Patriot game and the Emmys, but, you know, <laughs> I, I watched enough of the Patriots game to talk about it. I have to retract something that I said earlier in the, in the summer, and it wasn't on the show but it was just on Twitter and with my friends and I kind of was very hell bent on my opinion that I wanted to die on that hill. And I shouldn't have, because I was wrong. Cam Newton is hashtag back. I mean, he was done. He was, I thought he was washed out in Carolina. He played a really, really good game for the Patriots week one against your dolphins. And then week two here against a very, very good Seattle Seahawks team, a team that we both said would represent the NFC in, in the Super Bowl. 30 for 44, 397 yards passing. Um, one touchdown and interception, a rating of 94.6. He had 47 yards rushing, and he had two rushing touchdowns. And then he could have had three, but he came up a yard short on that final play of the game. We're going to talk about that more specifically after this. But uh, it's amazing the, the – the, uh, everybody could have gotten Cam Newton. And there was a stat about all these quarterbacks. There was like seven or eight of them who signed this offseason for more money and more years than Newton did. And the names are just like ridiculous. I think Blaine Gabbert was on that yet list. I don't have the list in front of me, but he was on that list. A bunch of other quarterbacks that aren't as good as Newton were on that list. He, complete renaissance from Cam Newton. I mean, again, like we talked about it last week. Just It's just perfect fit for the Patriots. It's just the Patriots doing whatever the, what they do best. Just they're, they're playing chess where everyone else is playing checkers right now. Again, you're paying him nothing, and he comes out and balls out. And again, here's my another 0 for 2 so far on the air. Apology to, to Cam Newton so far. He, he looked great. He absolutely looked great. He looked like a franchise quarterback. Again, I still – there were certain times in the game where his arms – it just looked like he kind of just like short arms a little bit. But, I mean, I, I'm no mechanical genius from the quarterback perspective, so I can't even judge there too, too much because – when he needs to throw it deep, he did it well. And when he needs to throw an arrow out, he did it well. When he needed to uh, beam it in uh, in front of a defender, he did that too. And then his legs, are, are they're still going to hold up. And again, they're going to hold up until they don't. But when that is, we'll find out. But just the, the whole game was crazy. I do have to admit, 
I fell, I fell asleep right after the kickoff. Woke oh up God. right when the game ended, but I went back and watched the highlights. Good, good, good. good. I, I was just like, it just the, the offenses on both teams were crazy. There was over 880 yards of offense to, uh, combined. So, again, tip of the cap to both offenses. And Russell Wilson, we'll get into him in a second. But defensively, the Patriots have to be like, all right, well, what's uh, what's going on a little bit? Because again, you can't say, oh, well, it's just Russell Wilson because. You're uh, supposed to be a, a Super Bowl or a playoff team, and you're letting up 400 plus yards and five touchdowns to, to Russell Wilson. Like that was kind of uh, alarming for me. Again, you weren't going to see the Dolphins do it in Week One and shock their their defense, but seeing Russell Wilson kind of pick them apart pretty good well, it was pretty interesting to see. And I think Belichick's really going to have to figure out all right, what are we going to do next time uh, we play a good offensive-minded team. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on, you know, being so hard on the Patriots defense. Obviously, giving up 35 points is not ideal, not what you want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they are going across the entire country to Seattle. I know there's no fans there, but that is very still a very tough place to play. Um, and and we, you said we were going to talk about it in a second. We could talk about it right now. Russell Wilson is one of the front runners with guys like Aaron Rodgers for, like, for NFL MVP. I know it's only been two weeks, but this guy's fantastic year in, year out. You know, 21 for 28, 288 yards, five touchdown passes. I mean, the guy's just ridiculous. Yeah, the, and the touchdown pa passes weren't just, all right, little little slant, no, uh, everyone's wide open, bang, end zone right yeah, there. Yeah, he had three oh, were... <laughs> over 20 yards. Yeah, They were bomb dimes. Or if he was in the red zone, he was running out like the first touch and he scrambled out a little bit, bang, right in front of, in between two defenders. And again, uh, I asked this question to a couple of our friends the other day. I was like, would, would, is Russell Wilson basically like, would you take him over Lamar Mahomes? And I think right now oh, through week two, I probably would. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, I, not, do, it. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. For, for someone who is constantly in MVP category, I feel like he is so underrated. And it's crazy. He is very underrated. I will agree with you there. He's underrated. I don't know why. It must just be a West Coast Mike Trout treatment kind of thing. But he mm -hmm. is severely underrated. I just – I don't understand it. And again, we could play this game all the time. But imagine Russell Wilson in the Chiefs system. Mm -hmm. just, he would – again, not knocking Mahomes because, again, both, both people can be great. Let's establish yeah. that first. You're allowed mm -hmm. to have two people be great. But – Russell Wilson just like he puts the team on his back. Yeah, it, it just you could just see his command of a team, of a system, of his offense, and just uh, just of the, of the football is it, just absolutely crazy. And he's got yeah. the footwork to get out of it. If he needs to scramble, he can. It just he is probably one of my favorite, if not the my favorite, a number one favorite player to watch right now, or basically player I'd want to have leading my team. If you look at, I'm gonna take. Patrick Mahomes out of the conversation for a second because I think Patrick Mahomes is on a league of his own. I think he's fantastic. I love him to death. I, I tweeted this on Sunday. I think he's going to be the greatest quarterback of all time. A little so, bit yeah. of a hot take so far. Still so young. But, you know, I live on hot takes. That's how I make my living. What's the wrong <laughs> when, I, when I compare Lamar to Russell Wilson, I, they're, they're very similar in my opinion. But the one difference to me so far, and, you know, this can change if Lamar, you know, continues to progress. He's still very young. He's like 22 years old. But, you know, Russell Wilson is like a second head coach on the field. He's like playing chess, as you would like to say, playing chess when everyone else is playing checkers. He knows exactly what the defense is going to do. He reads every single play. He's able, he's able to change the play you know, ex exceptionally well when he sees a defense that doesn't line with what he's about to do. He's like a surgeon on the field. And his, what's really impressive to me is his deep ball. His deep balls, he, he is so accurate. I don't think he gets enough credit for how accurate of a passer he is because everyone likes to see him like roll around in the pocket and, you know, dump it off. But he can throw the ball, you know, 30 yards down the field with, and getting into a tight window with ease. Yeah, I mean, you look at the, the, the deep touchdown at the pylon and the one to, to DK. And you're, you have defenders draped all over him. And he's just, whoop, dropped it in there. And again, like you said before, the throws are, are going 40, 50, almost 60 yards in the air. Like, that is so hard to do. And again, it, it, he does it. And that's me. We don't even talk about it because we just expect it to. We expect him to do it. It's just, he's one of those guys that I, I hope, and this is why I hope he, they make the Super Bowl again. And, and then he wins another one because I feel like 
the way they lost that to, to the Patriots, it just they just totally kind of just like shit on him from a, a mm-hmm. public public media kind of standpoint where he doesn't get any love anymore. And I, I don't really know why that is, but I'm, yeah. I'm that's why I'm here to give him the love that he deserves. And I think he's the absolute man right now. And then uh, definitely if, number one in my MVP category. Absolutely. I mean, if you remember, he was the first, he was a fourth round pick. He was just going to be the backup to Matt Flynn who signed a monster deal because he had a couple of good games in week 17 when he was a Packer and Aaron Rodgers was sitting. And then he just completely beats out Matt Flynn for the job. He wins that Super Bowl against the, the Broncos at MetLife Stadium, completely destroys the Broncos. That had a very, very good defense, if you remember, because mm-hmm. a couple years later they completely shut out Cam Newton, who he beat yet last night. And then, you know, the second Super Bowl, they don't give the ball to Lynch. He throws the interception. We all know what happened. We all, we all know we talked about it for years and years later. Yeah, but yeah. if that doesn't happen, and Marshawn Lynch gets the ball and he just runs it in. And, and, you know, Russell Wilson, by the age of 25, has two Super Bowls. We're talking about him in a discussion for one of the best quarterbacks ever. But because he lost that and now he only has one, and it's been, you know, five, six years now, and they've had a couple of, you know, playoff heartbreaks, we kind of we lose track of how great he is because of that one moment that really shouldn't have happened. Yeah, I'm I'm with you 100, percent and just like like we said with the Giants Bears game, that one ball uh, hits off one guy, lineman catches it, that changes the whole game, and again, it could change the whole season. Same thing with the Lynch situation in the Super Bowl, changes the whole game, could change his whole career. And like like you said, it's just it, from that moment on, it just it, something just happened where obviously yeah, he he didn't make the Super Bowl after that, but which is obviously gonna uh, not make him as a uh, in the public eye, we could say. But it's just he he needs he needs some love right now. And again, not that uh, anyone's really like hating on him, but I almost see this as his own internal kind of revenge tour to say, hey, I'm getting back to to who I was. Like, I'm, I I remember we were we were talking about me and I don't even know who one of my friends, and we were saying, all right, if, if Russell wins another Super Bowl or two, maybe he just goes plays baseball because he says, ah, I'm bored with football. That's mm-hmm. like how good he was at the time, or yeah. how good. He was being uh, displayed to the public. So I, again, we like you said before, you're saying how Mahomes is the greatest quarterback ever. That would have been Russell Wilson if yeah. Marshawn Lynch runs that in, because then Legion of Boom doesn't disband, and then bang. He why why couldn't they win another one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it really. That, that that's that he he would have been what Mahomes is now, the poster boy for the NFL, and he would easily I think would have had a third championship uh, on his belt. Because not only that, he's such he seems like such a great guy too, right? Yeah, it's a, it's always like, says the right thing. He's cool. I, I I like Russell Wilson. I think I'm really rooting for him to get back to the Super Bowl. And unless he plays the Chiefs, I hope he wins the Super Bowl because I'll root for him against anyone except Patrick Mahomes because I love him. But let's move on. Fair. Let's go to the end of the game on Sunday night, the last play. Mm-hmm. I immediately said that that was a terrible play call. I don't hate having Newton try to run it in. What I didn't like in the play call was they didn't have anyone, a back, a receiver out wide to play as kind of like a decoy to keep the defense honest for the opportun- for the like option of, hey, he might throw the ball. Everybody knew Cam Newton was going right up the middle with that ball. Everybody watching on TV, everybody that was allowed in the building knew. I was very surprised that a Belichick-led team that has been through it all, been through every single war, has seen everything there's nothing they haven't seen on a football field i'm surprised about that play call and i was wondering about your thoughts on that yeah when i saw it too and again they scored on that similar kind of play call yeah uh early in the, in the first. game so, so you would think they'd change it a little bit knowing that seattle just saw it a couple hours before yeah so it was one of those situations where like we were talking about uh just before with the lynch lynch and the seahawks you gotta run you gotta run it, and then they passed it this was like the opposite where it was like Why'd you run it? It just, it just, it was such a slow developing play. And I know that's kind of, I guess, what he's trying to wait for. He's trying to let some blocks develop. I get that. But the, the, the whole QB kind of option is useless. If like you said, you don't really have the other option of, Hey, maybe I could pass it. Like the whole RPO kind of thing. So now it, you just have everybody in the box, totally selling out. Not to mention you have Jamal Adams in the box, totally selling out on one guy. And it just – he didn't even sniff the end zone. He got yeah, upended close. probably three, four, five yards before he even got there. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I was – it was definitely just a little confusing that, all right, you're 
you're trusting that, all right, we're just going to just run it down your throat for how, however many times they did it. It was, it was just weird. I, I definitely would have rather seen him just maybe, hey, maybe a little play action and then try to just then scramble, hey, maybe see then, all right, now could I run it in or could I pass it? And just there, there's, there's a lot more options that, that you could have for success, I think, if you just do a little play action or at least, hey, maybe start to pass because then you can always run. But you can't yeah. buy into a run and then say, oh, shit, I'm going to not pass it. So that that's I, I'm I'm with you. That I was a little confused. Yeah, I was surprised they didn't have like a tight end kind of sneak out. Like we've seen that before. Like fake a little bit of a going in yeah, and do a just, little jump pass to the tight end. He's wide open in the back. He, there was no RPO. There was no bootleg to the outside. Newton just ran right through the middle. There was a lot of real estate towards the pylon that he didn't look at. It was just it was interesting that they would they that that's how it how it ended. But if mm-hmm. Newton does get in there, that we're talking about the Patriots being two and zero. Oh, and one of those wins being in Seattle. And we're talking, you know, about, holy shit, Belichick's going to win a Super Bowl with Cam Newton at his quarterback. It, it, it completely changed. I, I'm not going to say it changed the season because it's been two games, but what a win that, that could have been for the Patriots, especially with the Bills going 2-0. and Yeah, again, it's, it's – I, as of right now, just through two weeks, I, I have a feeling that the Pats are, are, are walking out of the AFC champions once again. Without Brady, it's going to be it's going to be hard fought. I think obviously between them and the Bills, but I just I Belichick he's just too good of a coach. He just got just too good of, of even coordinators. With you have his son calling the plays on defense, and then McDaniel's still calling the plays on offense. They're just again they're they're too good of of an organization. Just from Kraft all all the way down. I, there's no reason. That, that they pretty much won't be uh, AFC's champs once again, unfortunately. And you just popped this uh, idea into my head. It would be probably one of the most highly talked about, highly anticipated sporting events in history if Brady and the Buccaneers met Belichick oh, no. and the Patriots in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Can you even imagine? Can you even I, imagine what that would be like? I, again, and, and I know we have COVID going on, and not, not to uh, undermine – the severity of this situation. That's what America needs. They need Brady versus Belichick you, in the Super Bowl. You could, s- ring? you could sell out a 400,000 person arena or stadium yeah. if you had Belichick versus Brady. They, you the would entire have, country would shut down. The entire country would shut down. Oh, so you, you, could, you could sell it like a UFC fight and have media tours and then them just going out oh of press God. conferences back to back. You could sell the hell out of that thing. That would be absurd. And how NFL or how Tom Brady and Bill Belichick would that be? Just oh them two. You know, if the NFL out. was smart, I don't think contractually they probably can't do this. But how smart would it be if the NFL made it like a pay-per-view kind of situation? <laughs> just take my money. <laughs> just anything, like a thousand dollars to view it. I'll, I'll watch it. I, it's crazy. I'd and, figure it out. Oh, yeah, that would be <laughs> Brady. And the, Brady got his first win. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, real quick, I was just say. It's really not even that crazy uh, of an idea either, though. Like, like why couldn't like, again? We a it lot of happen. a lot of people ha- have the Bucks saying going to the the Super Bowl. The Patriots have clearly seen that they could be a Super Bowl contender. So, like, why basically like, crazier why things? That have, much crazier things have happened than a without Brady a doubt. First Belichick. Oh, I would love without that. That would be great. Brady did get his first win. We're not going to get too into it because nothing really eventful happened other than the McCaffrey injury that we just saw. He beat the Panthers 31-17, going a little rapid fire on scores around the NFL. Obviously, a couple hours ago, Vegas beat New Orleans 34-24, a little bit of an upset there. Uh, we saw Seattle beat the Patriots, Kansas City. What, oh, that was the most amazing feat I've ever seen in sports at the end of the Kansas City game, Matt. I don't know if you saw it, but the field <laughs> yeah. goal kicker, his name is what? It's, it's Budge- Butledge? Ha- ha- What's his Harrison name? Harrison Buck- Bucker. Bucker, B-U-K- right? B U T K E R. Okay, so Bucker, he, he has a 54 yard field goal attempt, kicks it through without a problem, but there's a five yard penalty. Brings it back to like a 58 yard field goal, kicks that, no problem. Could do it in his sleep. Ice the kicker, name of the show. Perfect, right? <laughs> then he has to do it again, and he hits. That's three 50 plus yard field goals in a matter of like three minutes. That is insane chicago bears fans couldn't even get uh cody parkey to hit one field goal 
uh, Vikings fans are still crying over Blair Walsh. Couldn't even make that 30-yard field goal, whatever it was. And this guy kicks three this straight guy. game-winning field goals in OT. Three straight for, and from, from the most impressive plus. thing I've ever seen in my wa- years watching football. The most impressive thing I've ever seen in my life was that. I mean, if, I'm if not I'm exaggerating. If, if I'm Patrick Mahomes, if I'm the Chiefs, I'm saying, all right. If Patrick Mahomes better I, buy the guy a car. I am I'm finding whatever salary cap I have left because I don't know how much it is for the Chiefs, and I'm throwing it all on this guy. That was, again, like you said, one of the craziest, and again, we'll probably forget about it in a week, feats in sports yeah. I've ever seen. I mean, you got to think about just. The, the absolute stones on this guy and the intestinal <laughs> fortitude to kick three in a row and not even like, all right, a little miss left, a little miss right, but it would still make like right down, right the, middle. down the dick, just absolutely <laughs> down the middle of the field. goal. I was blown away. And again, oh my if, God. If, he, if, if, if somehow, and we'll get into this a little bit, if Herbert, who I've shit on forever, his first win, as a professional, is against the yeah. Chiefs. That's just what it, it, I would have just probably stopped doing the show, just because I, I had no credibility anymore. I'm done. But I mean, thank God, and Quit. thank God the Chiefs. Oh for, yeah, thank God the that Chiefs themselves. Absolutely, they won. Um, that that was amazing. It, it was it, again. Every other kicker needs to go figure out Same. themselves right now and get on his level. He's the Michael Jordan of kickers in the and NFL. And the funniest thing is. Next next week he's gonna next week he's gonna miss like a chip shot twenty yard oh, field goal. Of course, yeah, you and know, then we're all gonna shit the, on him. <laughs> the, the, That's the how it works. Li- the, kicker the kickers can't win. Is is so is so bad. Because if you make NFL. a sixty yard field goal, hey, that's what you get paid to do. But if you miss like <laughs> yeah. a twenty five yard, you're, you're garbage. Absolutely. So I have a, uh, a question for you. So what do you think of Herbert in the Chiefs Chargers game? I thought he was good as I multitask to try to find my laptop charger. Give me a second here. Are you good? No um, I thought he was. I thought I was very impressed. I mean, he didn't know he was going to start until he didn't know he was starting until like game time. Yeah, you and then to go against the Super Bowl five champions, to, 10 seconds. to go twenty-two and thirty-three out of thirty-three over three hundred yards, a touchdown, and his what was this his first start? First start. I, I, I was very impressed. I mean, coming out of Baylor, Baylor, right? Uh, Oregon, 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 same colors. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So coming out of Oregon, uh, I remember like his YouTube came out. He had a reel came out like a couple years ago. Like I, I think it was a sophomore or junior year, and mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this is the guy the Giants are going to get. And then I don't. Think I, I, I was out. saying that too. I, I he didn't come out last year, and then they had the settle mm-hmm. on Jones. So I was kind of like, okay, they're going to get Herbert, and then he stayed at Oregon. For another year, but I, I I was very impressed. I didn't have yeah. a lot of high expectations for him because you know he was one of the later first round draft picks. He wasn't like mm-hmm. a Burrow kind of first overall, so like, he kind of got lost in the shuffle there in that draft. But I, good for him. I mean, well, yeah, why yeah, don't and, why don't and, you and, like him? What don't you like about him? He too small. Well, what's his deal? No, 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 no. So and, yeah, he he was a a six pick, and it's still funny because he was the sixth overall pick. But like you said, he still kind of gets forgotten about, mm-hmm. and. The reason, the reason I, the reason I didn't like him was he, he just reminded me of all the bad things that Tannehill did with us in Miami. Again, mm-hmm. he's the man right now, Tannehill, and absolute MVP, whatever, four touchdowns last game. But it, it was kind of the same knock I have, I had, past tense now, on Josh Allen that, yeah, he's got a cannon, that's awesome, but can you, can you throw with touch and? That was my whole thing watching him and extensively, especially because the Dolphins were possibly going to get him, was that he only knows one speed. So similar to Josh Allen, we need to see him throw with some touch. And his one touchdown pass, again, absolute dime, laser beam, which is awesome. But you did see him throw a lot of balls way wide, way long. Again, obviously, you're not expecting him to be Peyton Manning in one day. But that's what I'm looking at for right now. Mm -hmm. Again, the one decision he had, that one pick where he could have ran two feet and gotten the first down, and then he tried to throw across his body to the middle of the field that got picked. That yeah, we could chalk that up to a rookie mistake. But that's what I'm looking for for from from uh, Herbert is I want to see him be a lot more accurate than he is, and then be able to throw with some touch because you don't always have the luxury of just throwing the ball as hard as you can. Like that doesn't always cut it. Clearly, you could see with with like we said with Russell Wilson, just lightly bombing balls 50 yards and dropping it in over a defender. So that that's kind of what was my knock on Herbert going into this and still will be until 
He shows that he could throw with some touch. But, again, you, you couldn't really script a, a better way unless, unless he got a win, a better start for him. Again, five to ten seconds before game time, he's like, oh, yeah, you're going in. And then he puts on that performance. And, again, you, you had the lead for basically the whole entire game. And, and you, you basically, again, without Bucker, they're getting that win. So, absolute tip of the cap. Round of applause to Justin Herbert. However, Anthony Lynn, the head coach, doesn't seem to give him the same praise. And I was curious your uh, kind of feelings on this. And uh, Ian Rappaport tweeted, if Tyrod, and this is a quote from Anthony Lynn, their coach, if Tyrod Taylor is 100%, he's going to be our starter. Mm-hmm. And then I, I'll let you answer first how you feel about that. But it was a little questioning to hear that. Uh, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like Tyrod is going to be the guy. I think, you know, as you said, with in terms of Tua, um, with and same with like Tua and Fitzpatrick, that kind of relationship, have the rookie, you know, just watch and learn. And I think that Herbert will eventually be that guy in San Diego, but I don't think one game and then automatically Taylor's gone. I, mean, I think you need to see a little bit more from Taylor and see if he could actually lead this team. Cause he won the quarterback competition for a reason and mm-hmm. week missing week two, I don't think is going to change this. This is not like an Alex Smith Kaepernick kind of situation where you get Smith missed like a month. So if mm-hmm. Tyra Taylor missed like a whole month and Herbert played like this for four games, yeah, it's time to give it to Herbert. But I don't think missing one game should cost Tyra Taylor his, his starting job. But if you're a Chargers fan, talk about moral victories. You pushed the best team in the NFL to the brink. Your defense played very well, held Mahomes really in check for the first two halves or the first two quarters of the game. But mm-hmm. Herbert, you got, you got to be very impressed with what he showed you. And if you're a Chargers fan, you got to be pretty optimistic about the future of with him at quarterback, because, you know, it was kind of like, it was, I I wouldn't say a gamble at the sixth overall pick, but it was kind of, I would say a wild card with Herbert. I'm sure he was, he was the third, the third quarterback taken off the board. And if we go down the list of, of, of the third quarterbacks being drafted, Mm -hmm. they usually aren't very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know. I wouldn't get. I wouldn't give up on Tyrod Taylor because I think he won the quarterback competition for a reason. I still think Herbert has a lot to learn, especially with no preseason, no training camp. He needs to learn the playbook thoroughly. He needs to know his players, his receivers, and you can't do that without a training cap camp and a preseason. So he had that one good game, but is that sustainable over the course of a season if you just give him the reins? I'm sure you can think about this with Tua as well. Can he have flashes of brilliance if you throw him in there blind? Of course he can because they're so talented, but yeah. over the course of a season, those or a career that yeah, over or a career, especially in your rookie year, those, you know, those inexperiences will get exposed by teams like the chiefs. And as you go on in, in, in a really tough division. So I wouldn't, I, I don't take that much stock in Tyra Taylor coming back. I don't think it's a kind of, I don't think it's um, anything against Herbert. I just think that Lynn thinks that her, Tyrod Taylor gives them the best chance of winning at the moment. Yeah, and, and I'm sure Herbert didn't take it how I kind of took it, but it, it almost, to me, it looked like, all right, Herbert, basically, like, as, as a rookie and it's your first professional start, it was like, what more could he have done to earn that starting spot? So I, I do agree with everything you're saying, that there's still a lot of work to be done, and it still can be done on the practice field, still sitting behind Tyrod. But I, I maybe would have liked Anthony Lynn to, instead of saying, He's 100% our starter. Say, hey, maybe, yeah, we're leaning towards Tyrod still. Like, he's still our guy, but but show some love to Herbert and be like, hey, like, it's nice well, to see sure it. We have said a, it. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. But, entire transcript it, of the conversation of the press conference. But he might have said, yeah, he had a great game because he did. But, I, you know, I, if you yeah, say I, something I like that, so. like, oh, we don't know, we'll talk about it later, then that kind of starts a whole controversy and that becomes a distraction. The media is going to talked about to them every day who's starting i think it was good for lynn to say yes or no is it the way i almost like you were saying controversy i kind of see it as competition that's mm-hmm. just i guess where we differ and then again you look at like and this is kind of what i've been catching heat with with fitzpatrick and two and they're saying like fitzpatrick doesn't have a place on the dolphins next year and one could say maybe Tyrod doesn't either. So then you, you start looking at it in that regards. Then it's like, 
well, if Herbert had that one good game, why not just pull Joe Burrow and say, all right, here's the rest of them. So, again, I do agree with, with most of what, what you were saying about how he's still got a lot to learn and 100% agree there. But it, it's one thing, like we said, if Cap or like Kaepernick sat behind an Alex Smith and Mahomes sat behind an Alex Smith who – Alex Smith is not a placeholder quarterback. He is a legit quarterback in this league. So Tyrod, similar to what happened with him in the Browns, he went down, Baker went in, then it was go time. I don't see Tyrod as that legit, legit quarterback. He looks like more so a placeholder for Herbert. And unfortunately, I think for Tyrod is that his place is going to be taken over a little sooner than than he hopes. But well, well, I'm, yeah, I'm very I, I agree. I happens. think eventually by the, I think by the end of the year, I think Herbert will be the guy, but I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to give him a little bit more time because, I'm with you, there. Mm-hmm. you know, what, what's the worst thing that can happen? I mean, the chargers are one and one. Um, I think they can win with either of those guys. So I don't think it's a whole rush to get, you know, the rookie in there. So I'm with you there. Ar- around the league, Cincinnati beat Cleveland on Thursday. Growth Cleveland, Cleveland, Cleveland ball, like beat 70 Cincinnati. times. Oh, yeah, Cleveland – I'm sorry, misspoke. Cleveland beat Cincinnati. Um, Burrow threw the ball a million times, which is crazy for a rookie quarterback. San Francisco throttled the Jets. Uh, Pittsburgh moved on to 2-0, and beating the Browns – I mean, sorry, the Broncos. Indianapolis beat the Vikings, who looked terrible. Um, that, that's very surprising to me. Tennessee we went over. Uh, let, let's, let's, let's talk about Dallas now because, you know, that was wild. That was absolutely insane. First of all, in the first quarter – Dallas didn't want to be on offense, so they just gave the ball to <laughs> Atlanta every single time. <laughs> they, it was what? It was, it was two fumbles. It was, you know, going for it, a fake punt. They're, they were trying to lose the game. I don't know. Mike McCarthy, I don't know, had an aneurysm or something out there. I don't yeah. know what he was thinking. <laughs> um, but true to form with the Atlanta Falcons, we saw it in the Super Bowl, they absolutely blow it every single time. You cannot – lose this game and the how that and just the perfect encapsulation of atlanta falcons football is not knowing what to do on an onside kick i mean these guys on the hands team are on the roster because they're on the hands team they have no other purpose for the organization whatsoever <laughs> they just the, the cowboys just spun the ball and then atlanta just looked at it like it was like they had no idea. They never saw a football before. I don't understand. I don't know if they didn't know the rules, but you can go and pick it up. I mean, you don't need to wait for it to come to you. I, yeah, the I have Cowboys no idea what have, the hell that was. The Cowboys have to wait for the ball. To they cross. have to wait. That, yeah. Not because if the they Falcons. touch it before, it's a penalty. The Falcons could do whatever they want. And, and, and Julio Jones was standing right there, had a front row seat. You're getting paid, what, $20 plus million dollars, and you can't just scoop a ball up? Or any of those guys getting paid however much, like, I don't understand how every single person on that special teams wasn't told just, hey, you're running home to Atlanta from Dallas because yeah. that was absolutely embarrassing. I, I, how do you not know the rules? Uh, I, and Again, the, you have time before the, the onside and you're huddled up and you talk about it. How do you not go over, hey, they have to wait for the ball to cross this yard line, and then you have to try to get it before they do. It's just simple as that. Just grab the ball, you win the game. And they and we, couldn't do that. We live in an NFL today where getting an onside kick is probably the hardest thing to do in the sport. It's like, like there's it's like borderline a seven, impossible. A seven percent chance like I, that it happens. And they made it even harder because you can't stack everybody on the left or right side. Agreed. Everyone yeah. has to be even. How how does that happen? I don't under like. I think Dan Quinn is just absolutely clueless. That 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 falls on him. Like oh, he needs 100%. to get into the huddle before they get out there and say, "Okay, get the goddamn football." Yeah, I, I mean, it's just absolutely. besides the fact that yeah. we're uh, we're overlooking that they blew a twenty-six to seven lead. Besides, besides that, as well. at the very least, just pick up the football. That's it. That's just, just pick up the football. But no. So now. Again, this obviously hurts as a Giants fan and an Eagles fan, anyone in the NFC East, that you look at a division like we referenced earlier, that the division winner could be 9-7 and seven like last year. It could even be a little less, like 8-8. Eight and eight. And we're going to look back on this game, and the Cowboys are going to be 8-8 eight and eight or 9-7, and seven, and we're like, damn, how'd they get here? How, how, how did they scrape away that one extra win? And we're going to look at the shitty Falcons and Dan Quinn not knowing how what to do they? with his team on special teams. Like this, I mean – 
again, I don't have any hatred towards the Cowboys, but as a Giants fan, you you, you got to be just, just absolutely grinding your I mean, teeth It was here, just right? the icing on the cake of a terrible Sunday because I knew Barkley was out for the year. I, I knew the Giants lost and went to 0-2 for the, like, millionth year in a row. Yeah. And then my whole thing was, okay, the Eagles lost. They're getting killed by the Rams. The Redskins are going to hopefully lose the Cardinals, which they did, one-on-one. So, and the Cowboys are going to lose, so they're own 2 So the Giants are still very you're, – you're <laughs> Because right there. Atlanta doesn't know what they're doing. They never have, wow. never will. They need to fire their coach. They need to fire Quinn immediately. That's absolutely embarrassing. And now the Cowboys are one and one. Now, granted, they play next week. They play someone very difficult. I I'm, I'm, don't have their schedule in front of me, but I know they're playing someone. I'll get it up in a second. Da, 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 da. They play the Seahawks. They were at the Seahawks. So hopefully they'll lose that game. But, you know, the Cowboys are staring 0-3 in the face if you lose those two games and then have to go to Seattle. That could absolutely bury Dallas. And they just get a gift. It's unbelievable. And as a Giants fan, I'm furious because, you know, that, does, that wouldn't happen for the Giants. The Giants will yeah. do that. That's something the Giants would do. And, the and, and, and just, just to, to, to give credit where credit's due, Dak Prescott, holy Tremendous. hell. You gotta 400, give 450 yards passing, 18 uh, rushing, one touchdown passing, three touchdowns rushing. I mean, again, like we talked about Russell Wilson, you know what, putting the team on your back. Like it's just he again, had to. It, it, he absolutely had to, and, and he did. And it, again, it, obviously, you're not expecting every game to go like this, but just that win right there, Jerry Jones is gonna be like, all right, here's my, here's a blank check, whatever you want, you got it. it I'm looking at the money. win probability meter on ESPN. Oh my god, I couldn't even imagine. At second and seven, when Atlanta had the ball, second and seven at the Dallas 38. No, I'm sorry. Okay, when. And they're lining up for the onside kick. Ninety-nine point nine percent chance of winning. Just, and then it just completely dipped all the way down to zero percent. And that's and then again, the sad part is that's probably not. I'm looking <laughs> at it now. I have. I'm looking at the replay right now of the onside kick. They're just standing there. They're just they're just that, not that, doing anything. Like, like again, you could have. And like we're not articulating that, this well because there's nothing to say. Like it's just stupid what happened. You literally like like they were just standing. Both teams were standing around the ball. Like the Cowboys guys could have just came and just shoved the Falcons guy out of the way. Maybe it would have woke him up. They're probably glad they didn't. But like the the Cowboys like set a pick, do something, just like oh form a huddle around the ball, do anything. They literally stood there and just watched the Cowboys run in, take that ball for the win. It, and the amount of guys, again, when you go back and look at that, around the ball that were just standing up, there was maybe like two Falcons players that were actually yeah. trying to dive in and probably another three, one being Julio Jones, that just stood there. Like, what are you doing? In my, the, the owner of the Falcons has a quote. I'm going to read it right now. In my view, they clearly didn't understand what the rules were and exactly <laughs> what they had to do. That, that's on the head coach. That is a direct, like, shot at the head coach for not preparing his team to, you know, cover an onside kick. And you can't say, Matt, that this is because there's no praise. And you can't say that it's no training no, camp. Yeah, this is that's very, very basic fundamentals yeah. of the special teams unit. I, 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 again, I, I couldn't think of, uh, of an easier thing to go over in practice other than just say, hey, the ball needs to cross here. When it does, they are allowed to get it, and if they recover it, they get the ball. If we recover it before they do, we get the ball, and we win. It's literally as simple as that. And Like you said, Dan Quinn, he, he's got to be like, holy shit, if I don't win the next 30,000 games in a row, I'm getting the hell out of here. Because you have the owner saying that, that clearly they don't understand basically the rules of football. That's just – that's crazy. That's terrible. And can you imagine being an Atlanta Falcon fan? Can you imagine no, the TVs no. that, that just completely got thrown out the window? And again, I've been heartbroken many times as a Dolphin fan, but I am honestly That's glad that I'm not an Atlanta Falcons fan. I don't think there's a loss that could be worse. I think the Deshaun Jackson loss with the Giants could be worse than that. that but that, that, that's yeah, a pretty that's close second. There. That's up there. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what a worse way to lose. Because the Giants <laughs> lost to the Deshaun Jackson game. That could be on, you know, just getting outplayed by Michael Vick and Deshaun Jackson, although Matt, Matt Dodge is a moron. But that's just pure just lunacy. Like, that's 
pure, just stupid, bad fundamentals of football. And then, again, I don't know where we're at or on time, but we covered just about everything. But there's, there's one thing that I did want to talk about, speaking of just lunacy and bad oh. coaching. And obviously, we're going to go to the Jets. And oh we, we talked about gotta... We, yeah, we're, I, I think we should end it with the Jets here. And this is, goes all, out to all the Jets fans out there. And, again, not knocking Sam Darnold because I still think he can be a good quarterback. There's nothing against mm-hmm. him. But the way they're trending, number one, obviously, Gase has got to go. I think we can both agree on that. And I think all the fans yeah. pretty much can agree on that. But number two, the way it looks is that they're probably going to have a top five, if not maybe the number one pick in the draft. You have Darnold going into his fourth year, and like we said earlier, they could pick up his fifth-year option. If the Jets have the number one pick, do you draft Trevor Lawrence? And that is my question to you, and then also looking directly into the screen to every Jets fan out there. Do you say, hey, not that Darnold didn't pan out, but I'm going to do whatever I can to get the best quarterback possible playing for the New York Jets, and that is Trevor Lawrence right now, and there's not a doubt in my mind. So I'm curious what your opinion is, and then I'll give my thoughts on it. That's so tough because I do agree with you. I like Darnold as a quarterback. I think he has a monster arm. I think he has the build to be a very good quarterback in this league. I think he had – I mean, if you put him – if you put him in Buffalo and you replaced Allen with Darnold, Darnold's probably exceeding what Allen's doing in Buffalo, in my opinion. I think Darnold's a, a better skill set than Allen is, but I think That's Allen not, is just in a better it. system and with a more competent head coach. So I think it's unfair that Darnold is getting all this criticism. There's stuff that Darnold's doing that isn't, you know, perfect and isn't, you know, probably great for him. But mm-hmm. Adam Gase is terrible. I mean, they say he's a quarterback whisperer to who? Not to Tannehill. He did it to who? Peyton Manning? Well, Peyton Manning's pretty good with before him. And he was yeah. pretty good after him. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't th- I don't think – I think, you know, Peyton Manning was the whisperer to Gase. I don't think it was the other way around. That's, so that's a good point. If, if you get to 2-14, and 1-15, and 15, God forbid, for the Jets 0-16, oh and, and you have that opportunity to get Trevor Lawrence with Darnold with the new guy. And it would be tough because that would be Darnold's third head coach by the time he hits 24 because you can get a lot with that Trevor Lawrence pick. I mean, there's a lot of teams that are going to want Trevor Lawrence and they're going to give up everything to get him. Draft picks, first-round picks for the next three years you can get. Just yeah, You can get an absolute haul for Trevor Lawrence. And as a Jets – I'm not a Jets fan, but as if I was a Jets fan, I would see that haul as a more you know, valuable package to receive than actually getting the quarterback. Because, you know, if who, who's to say Trevor Lawrence doesn't suck, too? I mean, how many times are you going to keep get, bringing in a new guy? I mean, it went from Sanchez to Gino to Christian Hackenberg to Fitzpatrick to now Darnold. Like you got to stick with a guy eventually and just, just ride with it. So, so I'll try, try to tackle everything. So, like you said, you got to stick with the guy. And, and I think what they're going to have – what they're going to run into is that if they do bad and end up with a uh, top five pick, you you would have to assume Gase would be gone. I, I don't mm-hmm. care it, who gets it, how many uh, or use the injury excuse, whatever it is. You assume Gase is gone. So then you're obviously bringing a new quarterback, a uh, new coach. Uh, you're bringing a new coach. You don't really know who he wants, but what coach doesn't love a nice young rookie quarterback to start their career? Because you got to understand that it also gives that coach instead of hey maybe a three four year deal you're getting that full five year deal because you're going into it and you have a little more security saying hey i'm not really expected to win in years one or two but that third year hey you might but if you come into a situation with darnold and only darnold you're probably in more of a win now and again i know a lot of jets fans are still saying oh we're rebuilding we're rebuilding we're rebuilding well when are you going to start competing so the way i kind of see it, and then what i would do is you fire gase whether it be halfway through the year, end of the year, whatever. You bring in uh, a new coach. Again, I would go to Ann Arbor and throw the farm for uh, Harbaugh, but Mm -hmm. neither here nor there. And then I would draft Trevor Lawrence. And again, kind of disputing what you said about getting a haul is because the quarterback is absolutely the most important position on the field. So if I say 
don't get Trevor Lawrence, who again, let's just assume for right now, is he'd pan out or at least be better than Sam Darnold. If I say pass up on that and instead I get, oh, I draft a, a first round wide out, I draft a first round offensive lineman, I draft a first round, say, defensive back, whatever it may be with those two to three extra first round picks, it all means nothing if you don't have the guy at quarterback. And again, I know we can talk about, oh, Tannehill is a game manager or Jimmy G is a game manager. No, they're still very, very good quarterbacks. They don't need to be great, but they're very, very good. And I think, again, not not to fall into the trap of, all right, every college prospect to, to come out who's done well there is the next coming of Christ. But Trevor Lawrence has been the guy since his first season. He's mm-hmm. I, Again, I, I, I've talked about this a lot, how obviously in college players have to – it's, it's like three years after your high school graduation, they have to, uh, uh, until they can get drafted in the NFL. But if there was a draft and there were, if they were draft eligible right after his uh, NCAA uh, champ- or championship win, his, his college football championship, he would have been drafted first overall. I really don't think there's, there's a doubt in my mind that he would have been the first pick and someone would have invested the time and money into however he was probably 20 years old or even 19 years old because he came onto the scene and it was nothing like anyone's really ever seen. And again, you talk about build, you talk about the arm strength, you talk about the arm accuracy, you talk about the awareness, the just elusiveness, everything. I mean, again, Trevor Lawrence is a guy I, I would invest in. And again, it's going to suck because Darnold still hasn't proven uh, what he can do to the fullest extent, but it's just, it's one of the situations that the Dolphins ran into with Tannehill that, Hey, it's not working out here. It's yeah. not that it's not working out for you as a quarterback. We're not saying you stink, but it's just, it's just not working out here. So why not bring the hottest thing ever into the NFL with Trevor Lawrence and that hype train, and you bring him back to New York, and maybe the Jets kind of get some love that, that the, the media that New York has should, or should, should basically have. And you My ride problem with that, with that is that I agree with everything you say about Trevor Lawrence and his ability and potential, but – what you'd have to do if you're the Jets, you just got to restart. The, you got to restart the clock again with developing a guy, going through the rookie mistakes, going through mm-hmm. all the mistakes young quarterbacks make that Donald's doing now. Now you're going backwards in a, as an organization. How much longer, how many more years is this organization going to go backwards? So, it, it, it's hard to continuously just throw it all away and start from scratch. Yeah. And, and I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think the issue that, that the Jets kind of have had is that they've always, again, with, uh, with the exception of the somewhat recently, right, you got Darnold with uh, a, a top 10 pick and you got Adams with a, a top 10 pick. They've always kind of still been like, like in the middle team. I mean, you, you look at last year, they, they, they finished pretty good and they were just ended up kind of in the middle there. And you still, you, you see them, their trend, even if it's not record wise with Darnold and his, potential and his expectations that they're still a, a in the middle kind of team like they don't know what they are again like you say yes one Jets fan where are you at are you competing for a title are you competing for a playoff spot or are you rebuilding and I bet you yes 50 people you're gonna get 50 different answers so they don't really know what they are and I think that's the most dangerous thing in the sport of football is not knowing where you're at and I think the the Giants are, are so lucky because they're only in year two of Daniel Jones that they're still on of more of a, hey, we're still rebuilding. We're not there yet, but we're starting to kind of uh, turn the engine a little bit. But the Jets are a year advanced over the Giants where, hey, you have Sam Darnold in his third year. You have Gase in, in uh, the second year with everybody. So, like, why, why are you not almost somewhat competing for a playoff spot? Like, there's no reason that they should be basically having this conversation that they – um and they might go 0-16 or whatever it may be, or that they don't really know what they are. So I well, think, I think the, the reason that, why they're not is because the coach is so bad. 100%. Now, what if you get a competent offensive head coach to who's actually good at developing quarterbacks, unlike this lie that Adam Gase is? Now, what happens, if, what happens if Darnold, they, get, they trade Darnold, draft Lawrence, they got to rebuild with Lawrence now, and then Darnold, first year out of the Jets, becomes the superstar. I mean, that, you run that risk as well. And, and, and that's, again, that's a risk too, but put it this way, Darnold having success, does that 
hurt the Jets having success per se. I would say realistically only if it meant he went to another AFC's team, which you don't really see happening. I don't think there's any chance. No, they wouldn't go to that. So that's that's one of those things where hey, but they would that, have again, to wait because it's going to take it's it, as great as Lawrence is. It's still going to take of course, him of course, of course, two to three years to reach his NFL potential. As if you know the first year when Lawrence is a rookie with the Jets, and you know Darnold goes to, I don't know, whatever team, and he just lights it up. That's 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 rough. It it, it yeah it it's it's one of those just like it's those situations it's where a catch twenty two. It, it, it's it's you have to be comfortable seeing your ex QB uh uh being successful, but it it shouldn't change kind of your team's success and then your faith in your own new new bay quarterback co- kind of coming in to use that analogy a little bit. So you really have to again, Gates wouldn't be able to do it, but another more veteran again, someone like a Harbaugh who could say, hey, listen, he's gone. We don't, we're not talking about him anymore. We're investing in this team and we're investing in this guy, potentially uh, a Trevor Lawrence. And whatever he does, we can't look at that. Same thing with, with the Dolphins with Tannehill. You just you, you tip the cap and you move on because you can't yeah. do anything about what ifs, and especially GMs and coaches can't be going down the what if train because then maybe they're not the most qualified guys there. But th- this just stems with, with everything we've kind of talked about with why these certain teams are so successful. They just have great leadership and then they have great coaches. So – it, you got to just rip the Band-Aid off with Gase, and you got to just uh, – honestly, I, I just clean house. And, again, not every, every Jets fan's going to be like, oh, well, Darnold's still this, he's still that. I get that. I understand that. But th- this, this experiment is not working, and it's not solely because of him, partly because, yeah, he hasn't done too, too well, but it's because the situation you put him in. You put him in an awful, awful situation, and he's not a bad player, but the situation he's in and, and the results that he's putting out because of the situation he's in – are, are not good at all. So rip the Band-Aid off. Say, hey, listen, it was nice knowing you while we did. Enjoy the rest of your life. But we got to invest in somebody new. And we got to mm-hmm. find who's going to be our new Bay at quarterback. And, that, and that's what I think that they need to do. Because the way it looks for the Jets right now, they don't know what they are. And they're going to stumble upon a top five pick and still not understand who, who to draft with it. And Trevor Lawrence might be on the board. And that's a guy I would not pass up on if I'm them. Yeah, and you know we're, we were running out of time, but we're not we're not going to get into the whole thing. But you can go down the list, even in the Jets organization. Do you even trust the front office to make that decision? I mean, they like Douglas, but you know what what has this front office done in the last you know two decades that gives you any kind of confidence that they're going to do the right thing? So it's definitely going to be it's going to be tough with the Jets and this conversation. I, the more they lose, the more this this conversation is going to get hot. Because it's, think, it's, it's inevitable that this is going to be a decision that this organization is going to have to make if Gase sucks and Darnold continues to struggle under Gase and you have this you know, Clemson quarterback in Lawrence who's just lighting up college football. It, it, it's, it's an inevitable disaster either way. Whatever d- decision they make, it's going to get panned either way. And let, let's, let's, let's to, to try to kind of force that a little bit, let, let's see where Jets fans, and I want them to answer this question to themselves now, what would you do? And then – I want them to answer the question again when Trevor Lawrence probably wins the, the national championship. And then we'll see that they're going to be like, oh, yeah, hell yeah, we'll go with him over Darnold. So the draft is still seven months away. So yeah. <laughs> we will, we, 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 we have, have a lot of, t- I feel like this is not the last time we'll have this conversation on the show. No. It's going to be a long, long time. And I, I wish Garrett was here that I can get his opinion. On because you know he's the Jeff fan of the show. We'll have to get him next week. We'll get next week. We'll get him. So that will just just about do it. Unless Matt has any uh, final thoughts, nice little uh, prediction on Thursday's game. Maybe anything, any final thing? Uh, yeah. Thir- I mean Thursday, like I said, Dolphins. It should. It's got to be a must win. But uh, last thing I want to say is just first, thank you to everybody kind of so far who's been following us, listening to us, and just kind of reacting with it. It's been awesome, and this is my first experience yeah. w- with the podcast. Glenn's been doing this. He's been awesome as a co-host here kind of just helping me out and feeding me stuff to do and uh, a lot of constructive criticism but I just want to say thank you to everybody out there listening supporting us and kind of coming along with us on this journey and any recommendation stuff you guys have let us know again we're not multi-millionaire guys uh, getting paid by ESPN we're all just your friends so let us know hey maybe stuff you want to talk about shoot me a text shoot me DM Uh, I'm all ears yeah, but we're not like – this isn't this isn't part of my take. This is all for fun. Yeah. Those guys exactly. are crazy, but – But, yeah, I'm completely 
the first episode is knocking on the door of 100 views on YouTube, but it's not viral by any means. But, you know, for two kids from Paramus, New Jersey, that's pretty good. And, you know, the second episode's up. It did pretty good. Um, So it's awesome. And, you know, keep listening. And we really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you to everybody yeah. out there listening to us. It's, it's, it's a wild ride. And we hope, um, we hope to be entertaining during this, you know, very weird time in history with everything that's going on. So to spend an hour talking about football is much needed because, you know, it's a lot of, sh- it's a lot of shit out there. So mm-hmm. that's, that's cool. Um, that'll just about do it for this episode of Ice the Kicker. This is episode three, so that means we're eligible to be on Apple Music. So hopefully that is available soon. So for Matt Ferrara, my name's Glenn Denegris, and we will see you next week.